Hi all, in this lecture I'll be talking about fallacies and I'll be following the, the presentation of uh, fallacies given in the Hurley text in 3.2. So first, let's talk about the definition of fallacies. A fallacy is a defect in an argument that arises from either a mistaken reasoning or the creation of an illusion that makes a bad argument appear good. So they can be intentional or unintentional. And they can also be formal or informal. So formal fallacies would be mistaken, using mistaken argument forms of the kind that appeared in chapter seven, chap chapter six and chapter seven. So if somebody affirmed the consequent. So if somebody said, if A then B, B therefore A, that would be a formal fallacy, even if those variables were, fill, were filled in. What we'll be talking about today are informal fallacies. So we're going back to inductive arguments. In chapter six and seven, we were all in on deductive arguments. Now we're back to inductive arguments, which we haven't covered since ch chapter one. Informal fallacies are fallacies of relevance, or a kind of informal fallacies, fallacies of relevance. They have premises that are logically irrelevant to the conclusion. So even if the premises are true, they wouldn't lead, wouldn't give adequate support to the conclusion. Today we're going to talk about eight types of fallacies and give some examples. At the end, we'll have a brief quiz. You'll have to take notes on the answers there. So when you go to Canvas, you can uh, get those questions and answers right. <clears throat> All right, first. The first fallacy that we'll cover is the appeal to force. That occurs whenever an arguer poses a conclusion to another person and tells that person either implicitly or explicitly that some harm will come to her, him or her if she does not accept the conclusion, and furthermore, that they'll be the ones bringing, that the arguer will bring about the harm. So slightly distinct from a fallacy that will come later, the appeal to fear. So uh, a part of the appeal to force that's really important is that the person, the arguer is in control over the bad things happening to the listener. So I have an example here over on the right hand side. Excuse me, if you don't come to democracy, democracy will come to you. Imagine that the sitting president of the United States tweeted this at a foreign nation, uh, then they would be telling that foreign power, you should come to democracy because if you don't, then I will have the army drop bombs on you. So that would be a clear appeal or the, the Air Force drop bombs on you. That would be a clear appeal to force. The appeal to force does not have to be a physical threat. It could be a psychological threat. It could be bringing about bad consequences. So if your employer tells you that you should do something that's immoral and if you because if you don't, they'll fire you, that would be an appeal to force in the same sort of way because your employer has the power to fire you. So that one should be pretty straightforward. The next one should be too. The next fallacy is the appeal to pity. That occurs when an arguer attempts to support a conclusion by merely evoking pity from the reader or listener, especially when pity is inappropriate. So an example that the text gives. Your Honor, I admit that I declared 13 children as dependents on my tax return, even though I only have two. But if you find me guilty of tax evasion, my reputation will be ruined. I'll probably lose my job. My poor wife will not be able to have the operation that she desperately needs, and my kids will starve. Surely I am not guilty. So in this example, the person's guilt or innocence does not depend on how bad the consequences will be for the person. It depends on whether or not they committed the crime. So when the defendant argues in this way, they're appealing to pity when it's inappropriate. I hear a fair amount of appeals to pity at the end of the semester. So people say, I have to pass this class because if I don't, then unfortunate consequences X, Y, and Z will occur. And I have to say, apparently you weren't paying much attention when we were talking about appeals to pity because grades are based on merit, not on what consequences might come if you 
if I give you a grade, right? So that also would be a fallacious appeal to pity. Now, sometimes compassion is warranted. So we have to be careful to distinguish between a fallacious appeal to pity and an argument from compassion. If somebody was saying, look, we have plenty of plenty of money, plenty of food, and our good friend is starving to death, we should probably help him out through this tough time. That would be an argument from compassion. That wouldn't be a fallacious appeal to pity. That would be a completely legitimate argument. So it's a fine line. When is pity, uh, when is pity fallacious? When would the appeal to pity be fallacious? And when would it be a legitimate argument from compassion? But you should be able to determine at least the very clear cut cases. All right, then we get a few varieties of all under the umbrella of appeal to the people. So the next few fallacies that we cover will all be varieties of appeal to the people. The appeal to the people fallacy uses the desires, for example, to be loved, esteemed, or admired of the listener or reader to get the listener or reader to accept a conclusion. So let's look at some varieties of that. The first is the direct appeal to the people. So when somebody addresses a large crowd and tries to create a mob mentality to win the acceptance of whatever conclusion they're pitching, that would be the example of a direct appeal to pity, or sorry, a direct appeal to the people. You see this when politicians are speaking to their base. They're trying to rally them into a frenzy, talking about their shared values and commitments and the politician is trying to get them to get other people to vote for them, make sure that they vote for them, trying to whip them into a frenzy to get them to do what they want to do, accept some policy or uh, vote for them, whatever it might be. That one's pretty straightforward. As is the next one, you've probably heard of this one before. So this is an indirect variety of appeal to the people. This is a bandwagon fallacy. So a bandwagon fallacy a bandwagon argument goes like this. Everybody believes or does belief X or action Y. Therefore, you should believe X or do action Y. So because everybody or a significant amount of people believe or do something, therefore you should too. This happens a lot in advertising. So here's a uh, billboard for McDonald's that says billions and billions served. Let's say that was a premise for an argument. McDonald's has served billions and billions, therefore you should eat at McDonald's. That would be a bandwagon argument. The next indirect variety of appeal to the people is the appeal to vanity. The appeal to vanity links the love, admiration, and approval of a crowd with a popular figure to win acceptance of a conclusion. Again, you see this often in advertising. So here's an example. I'm Alicia Silverstone and I'm a vegetarian. She's a, she is or was a famous actress. Linking our admiration with her uh, and trying to get us to be vegetarians as well. Now, it's important to point out that just because an argument is fallacious, that doesn't mean the conclusion is false. It just means that the premises that are used in the argument do not support the conclusion enough. So just because Alicia Silverstone is a vegetarian, that doesn't mean that we should be vegetarians. We should be vegetarians for other reasons, that we can have a nutritionally adequate diet and we can limit the amount of suffering we're causing sentient beings. Therefore, we should be vegetarian. Th that would be a good argument for being vegetarian, but because some popular figure is, that's just an appeal to vanity. Now, these are very effective and they work on me. I know these fallacies, but uh, after the 2016 Warriors lost to the Cavs in the finals, it was heartbreaking, but that year, under Armour, Steph Curry's shoe company came out with a really good commercial where it was playing basketball and he said, make that, we're gonna make that old. 
all, he talked about all the criticism that he was getting and he was going to make that old and he was working hard and dedicated. And I saw that being a warrior and Steph Curry lover. And I thought I need to get these Under Armour basketball shoes. But after the commercial went off, I thought, oh, I haven't played basketball in years. And the last time I played, I twisted both my ankles. I probably shouldn't buy these shoes. So I dodged that bullet. But this appeal to vanity, appealing to our love of certain figures can be very powerful. The next indirect variety of appeal to the people is the appeal to snobbery. This occurs when an arguer appeals to listeners' desires to be part of a small, exclusive, and thought to be allegedly superior group. It's almost the opposite of the bandwagon fallacy. So bandwagon fallacy says you should do X because everybody's doing X. The appeal to snobbery says you should do X because only a select few do X. So you see this all the time in advertising luxury, the advertising of luxury products. So here's a real Rolex ad. It says, you're not ready. You're young. You haven't been with the company all that long. You're not quite sure of your position. Maybe in a few years when you're a little more established, but not yet. Of course, if you disagree, you can visit an official Rolex jeweler. So this is making, building a case that people who have, own Rolex watches are established in their careers, they're sure of their positions, they are comfortable uh, with their finances, and if you want to be a part of that select few, then buy this Rolex, right? Now, appeals to snobbery can happen even with ideas. As an older teenager, I came across the writings of one of my favorite philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche, and he would seduce me into believing his ideas because he would say things like, these harsh truths are not for everybody's ears, but just for us. We select few can handle these bitter truths. And I thought as a teenager, I was like, oh yes, this is so cool. I'm part of this small club of people that believes this. And that was just a total appeal to snobbery. The next indirect variety of appeal to the people is the appeal to tradition. So that occurs when an arguer cites the fact that something has become a tradition, that people have done something or believe something for a long time as grounds for some conclusion. You see this when people uh, often when people are making arguments against the legality of gay marriage. So. Here was Chief Justice John Roberts saying, every definition that I looked up prior to about a dozen years ago defined marriage as unity between a man and a woman as husband and wife. Obviously, if you succeed, that core definition will no longer be operable. You're not seeking, those of you who would try to legalize gay marriage, you're not seeking to join the institution, you're seeking to change what the institution is. So his argument is that marriage has been defined this way, so it should continue to be defined this way. But the amount of time that something has been believed or done is no indication that it's what should be believed or done. So the response would be, yeah, it's been like that, but should it remain like that? That's still an open question. The fact that it's been that way for a long time doesn't have any bearing on whether it should remain that way. And of course, it shouldn't. So. The amount of time is no indication. Now, there is the opposite fallacy here, and that's the appeal to novelty. The appeal to novelty says belief X or action Y have only been believed or done for a very short amount of time. They're the new idea on the block. Therefore, we should believe X or do Y. And that also is fallacious. The amount of time that something has been believed or done is no indication that we should continue believing it or doing it. So all the previous were varieties of appeal to the people. We got five, we got direct, and then four varieties of indirect appeals to the people. And I missed one. 
So there are actually five indirect varieties of appeal to the people that the chapter covered. There are the four that we discussed. There are, there's bandwagon, appeal to vanity, appeal to snobbery, appeal to tradition, and there's also appeal to fear. The appeal to fear fallacy works like this. An arguer tells the listener or reader, you should believe X or do Y, because if you don't, then bad consequences will occur. Now, this sounds a lot like the appeal to force. The difference between the appeal to force and the appeal to fear is that with the appeal to force, the arguer had some control over the bad consequences occurring. With the appeal to fear, they're just saying bad consequences will happen. They're not going to bring about the bad consequences but they are trying to convince you that they'll occur if you don't take up uh, their belief or do what they want you to do. So an example would be, you would see people arguing about this when they talk about transgender people using bathrooms of the gender that they identify with. So you'd see commercials ran in places that were trying to make it legal for people to use bathrooms of the gender of which they identify. In those states, some of the, um, they'd run ads and they'd show, on one ad in Texas, they showed uh, the shoes, it was just ground level and it was black and white and they just showed the shoes of a little girl walking into the bathroom. And then after it, they showed the heavy footfalls of what we assumed was a transgender person coming in behind them. And it was like threatening music played. So there was an appeal to fear. They, the people say, were making the case that you shouldn't allow people to use the bathrooms for the gender with which they identify because bad things will happen to little girls, I think was the argument. Of course, there's no evidence to support that. That was just a, an appeal to fear. All right, so the next kind of fallacy that we're going to talk about are ad hominem arguments, which uh, is a fancy way to say argument against the person. So this type of fallacy always involves two arguers. One of the one of the arguers advances a certain argument and the other then responds by directing his or her attention not to the first person's argument, so not by showing that their premises are false or even if they're true wouldn't lead to the conclusion, but rather directing their attention to the first person themselves. The second person in this case is said to commit an ad hominem fallacy. There are three ways in which the ad hominem fallacy occurs, at least three. The first is ad hominem abusive. So in the ad hominem abusive, the second person, so the person who's listening or reading the argument, responds to the first person's argument by verbally abusing the first person. So if somebody gave you an argument that you should see a movie because it has it won some Oscars and has a great plot and great actors and a great director. And if you responded to their argument, not by talking about the merits of their argument, but by saying, oh yeah, but look at your shoes. Your shoes are really ugly. We're not going to see that movie. That would be a very obvious ad hominem abusive. So I have some examples here on the screen of ad hominem abusive. Conservative media figures in, in the right, so let me just read it. It says the conservative media, college dropout, college dropout, college dropout, the liberal media, William and Mary, Stanford University, Cornell University, I rest my case. I think the argument that this is putting forward is the conservative media is nothing but a bunch of college dropouts, therefore their arguments are not worth listening to. Now, we should point out when we're talking about ad hominems that even people who are college dropouts can give good arguments. I mean, you're all in college and there might be circumstances that would cause you to drop out. That doesn't mean I 
discount all of your arguments because that might happen. That's ridiculous. Even people who don't have degrees can give good arguments. So we have to evaluate their arguments on for their merits, not just by pointing fingers and calling people college dropouts. That's not going to work. Or it shouldn't work. But this ad hominem abusive strategy does work. And here's evidence. Look at the picture on the bottom left. The picture on the bottom left was a, a cartoon lampooning the Republican debates in 2016. Here's uh, Carson and Jeb Bush and Fiorina and uh, Donald Trump on stage. Trump saying Jeb is boring. Dr. Carson is a quack. Fiorina has cooties. And that's not very far off from what actually happened. The other candidates on stage would make arguments and Trump would just call them names and he'd relentlessly attack them personally and he continues to do this all the time and apparently it's effective because people vote for it but just because again just because somebody can be called a name doesn't mean that they have bad policy positions or doesn't mean that they wouldn't be a good leader of the country etc cetera, etc cetera, right so these are all examples of ad hominem abusive the next kind of ad hominem is ad hominem circumstantial when committing the ad hominem circumstantial, the respondent attempts to discredit the opponent's argument by alluding to certain facts, certain circumstances that affect the opponent. For example, the opponent benefiting from the argument being if the argument were accepted or having a background that might determine their position. So it's essentially saying, oh, of course you would give that argument. You're in circumstances that if the conclusion were accepted, it would benefit you. Imagine somebody gave an argument, a persuasive argument for raising the minimum wage. They said, look, it hasn't been raised. Well, let's not use that example. Um, let's say somebody gave a persuasive argument that, well, let's just look at the example I have on the screen here. On in that cartoon, it's two lawyers and the judge, and one lawyer is saying to the judge, but your honor, he's just saying that because his client is paying him to. And the conclusion that he's driving at is, therefore, we shouldn't take the other lawyer's argument seriously. Now, of course, it's true that the other argument, that the other lawyer is being paid by his client to make an argument, but that doesn't mean his argument is untrue. It means maybe we should be suspicious of it, but that doesn't make, that doesn't by itself mean that his argument is not a good argument. It's an attack against the circumstances, not an attack on the argument itself. If somebody was going, uh, okay, let's do another example. So somebody was arguing that the that their homeowners association should allow playgrounds to be uh, installed and their the homeowners should be allowed to install playgrounds in their backyards. And imagine somebody stood up and they gave an argument that they should allow that. They could say it would bring a lot of joy to the kids and if they met certain... Uh, design standards, they wouldn't be eyesores, etc. And imagine somebody else stood up and said, of course you would give that argument because you have kids and you would benefit from it. Well, that doesn't make their argument wrong. That doesn't make their argument unsound or uncogent. They, we should evaluate their argument on its own merits, not based on whether or not they would benefit. The next fallacy is called the U2 fallacy or tu quo quay, tu quo quay fallacy. When committing the tu quo quay fallacy, the second arguer attempts to make the first appear to be hypocritical or arguing in bad faith. An example of this before I get to the little cartoon here would be, imagine you go to the doctor's office and the doctor tells you, hey, you really should stop smoking smoking causes lung cancer and dying of lung cancer is not a good way to go you should stop smoking right now and then imagine you walked out the door the doctor had gone out a back door you turn the corner you see the doctor herself smoking 
and you say to her, you're smoking and you, you just gave me the argument that I should stop smoking, but you smoke yourself. So your argument is uncogent. The doctor would be right to say that's a fallacy. Like just because I can't, I'm not living up to the standards that I'm proposing, that does not mean that you should not. Those points that I made still stand and they do support the conclusion. So this is like finger pointing, right? So another, if you've heard in the pop, in pop culture, what about -ism. So somebody's confronted with doing something bad and they point the finger back at the person pointing out that they're doing something bad or at somebody else. These would be examples of the U2 fallacy. Uh, an example in this cartoon, somebody, imagine somebody makes an argument, we should improve society somewhat, and then somebody else said, ah, oh, but look, you benefit from the way society is. So you can't make that argument. That would be ridiculous. Of course, people are participating in society just because people think we should improve society. Even though they may be participating in it, that doesn't discount their arguments. So you would hear this uh, if people were saying we should more fairly distribute wealth than capitalism, than capitalism run amok the way it is now. And somebody might say, oh, but you're typing that out on your iPhone. So your argument's invalid. That would be a U2 fallacy that has no bearing on how good their argument is. All right, so those three varieties of ad hominem, the abusive, circumstantial, and the U2 fallacy. Next fallacy is the fallacy of accident. The fallacy of accident is committed when a general rule is applied to a specific case it was not intended to cover. So in the little in the little cartoon here, it says it, there's a school uh, a school child um, speaking up saying, if two negatives make a positive, how come two wrongs don't make a right? Imagine they were saying two negatives make a positive, therefore two wrongs make a right. They'd be taking a rule from math, applying it to ethics, and that rule doesn't apply. So that would be the fallacy of accident. Imagine another example where if somebody said anybody who sticks a knife in somebody should immediately be thrown in jail. And premise two was that surgeon just stuck a knife in somebody. Therefore, that surgeon should go to jail. That would be the fallacy of accident. That's shouldn't that rule is not meant to be applied in that circumstance. The next one is one that occurs all the time. It's called the straw man fallacy. That's committed when an arguer distorts an opponent's argument for the purpose of more easily attacking it, demolishes the distorted argument, and then concludes that the opponent's real argument has been demolished. So somebody, again, there are two arguers necessary here. Somebody proposes an argument or a theory. Somebody who wants to attack, wants to refute the first argument says, mischaracterizes it, makes a bad copy of it, so makes like a straw man, and then attacks that straw man and claims victory over the argument. That's a bad way of attacking, trying to refute arguments. Happens all the time, though. We have to be on guard against committing it ourselves. I look back at all my undergraduate philosophy papers, and they were nothing but straw men coming up with bad interpretations of philosophers arguments so that I could then attack them, but they were uncharitable in the extreme. So we have to be on guard, not just that other people might be doing this, but we might be doing it ourselves unbeknownst. So we have to read carefully, try to be as fair as we can to our opponents, even going so far as to make their arguments better for their positions before we start attacking them. So an example of that, this is not a real church sign, but Imagine this science, this, imagine it were real, and it said, if evolution were true, mothers would have three arms. Mothers don't have three arms, therefore evolution is not true. The strategy here, why it's a straw man, is saying that people who believe in evolutionary theory are committed to the idea that mothers would have three arms, but of course, no such thing. 
right? So then saying, well, that's not the case. Mothers don't have three arms, therefore evolution is not the case. That would be committing the straw man fallacy. Let's look at some other examples from the text here. Mr. Goldberg has argued against prayer in the public schools. Obviously, Mr. Goldberg advocates atheism, but atheism is what they used to have in Russia. Atheism leads to the suppression of all religions and the replacement of God by an omnipotent state. Is that what we want for this country? I hardly think so. Clearly, Mr. Goldberg's argument is nonsense. So what was the straw man here? Some Ms. Goldberg, Mr. Goldberg was arguing that public school is not a place for prayer, presumably because of separation of church and state, etc., etc. And then the, the second arguer here, argue, the person arguing against Goldberg, says that's advocating atheism. But you could think that prayer should not be in public schools without being an atheist and without advocating atheism. So this is, and then the arguer goes on to attack atheism. So it's setting up a straw man, saying that the arguer is committed to something that they're not committed to, and then knocking that down, claiming victory over the original argument. The next fallacy we're going to cover is the red herring fallacy. That's committed when the arguer diverts the attention of the reader or listener by changing the subject to a different but sometimes subtly related one. The arguer presumes by doing so that some conclusion is established. So a red herring is a fish red pretty fish. It swims by. We'd be distracted. We'd want to look at it. That's the way this argument goes. Let's see it in action. Environmentalists are continually harping about the dangers of nuclear power. Unfortunately, electricity is dangerous no matter where it comes from. Every year, hundreds of people are electrocuted by accident. Since most of these accidents are caused by carelessness, they could be avoided if people would just exercise greater caution. So why is this a red herring? Because the original topic was that we shouldn't use nuclear power because it's dangerous. Then the arguer talks about all the dangers of electricity, completely diverting the topic from nuclear power to talking about electricity. So this would be an example of a red herring. It never even the argument never even comes back to the original issue. It just goes on to the new topic. Another example. There's a good deal of talk these days about the need to eliminate pesticides from our fruits and vegetables, but many of these foods are essential to our health. Carrots are an excellent source of vitamin A. Broccoli is rich in iron, and oranges and grapefruit have lots of vitamin C. So the original issue is about pesticides. Then this person goes on and on about the benef health benefits of eating fruit. Of course, the original arguer was not saying that we should stop eating fruits and vegetables, just that we should look at the dangers of pesticides and maybe consider new policies. But they certainly weren't proposing that we should not eat fruits and vegetables. So this would be an example of a red herring just leading us away from the original topic. The final fallacy that we're going to cover this lecture is missing the point. This fallacy occurs when the premises of an argument support one particular conclusion, but then a different conclusion is drawn. Now this can be a big catch-all fallacy. A lot of the earlier fallacies could be characterized as missing the point. Missing the point is a pretty general fallacy. And if we're going to accuse somebody of missing, missing the point, then we should be able to supply the conclusion that the premises actually would lead to. And then note how the one that they drew was different. So let's look at some examples. One, crimes of theft and robbery have been increasing at an alarming rate lately. The conclusion is obvious. We must reinstate the death penalty immediately. So the claim is that this argument is missing the point. Why is it missing the point? Well, the premise is that theft and robbery, of, crimes of theft and robbery have been increasing a lot. The conclusion is that we must reinstate the death penalty. That premise does not support that conclusion. Usually, theft and robbery are not punished by the death penalty. So what kind of conclusion would be warranted here? Well, maybe it would be something like increasing police force in hot spots. Maybe it would be looking at the underlying economic inequality that often leads to crimes of theft and robbery. 
Many conclusions could be warranted there, but this one that we must reinstate the death penalty immediately, certainly not warranted. Another example, abuse of the welfare system is rampant nowadays. Our only alternative is to abolish the system altogether. Now, even if it were true that abuse of the welfare system were rampant, that wouldn't support the conclusion that we should abolish it immediately. It would more likely support the conclusion that we need to reform the system a little bit. That might be warranted if it were true that abuse of it were rampant. Now, of course, it's not true that it's rampant. Uh, depending on what your definition of rampant is, you can look these statistics up yourself. I sometimes ask students in class how, what percentage of SNAP funds, so that's essentially food stamps, what percentage of SNAP funds are fraudulently spent or received? Hazard a guess. It's 5%. 5% of SNAP funds are fraudulently received or spent. So uh, that's the equivalent of about how much private businesses lose to theft and embezzlement and stuff like that. So is abuse of that system rampant? Well, just as much as theft is, which is not a huge problem, of course, depending on where you live. So should we be so concerned about that system and should we try to abolish it on those grounds? Certainly not. So not only with that argument is it missing the point, but also the premise is just flat out false. All right, so now that we've covered these eight fallacies and different varieties of some of them, we're gonna to get to our quiz question. So quiz question one. Here's an argument. Bernie Sanders argues that we should raise the federal minimum wage. Since we haven't raised the inflation-adjusted minimum wage since the early 70s, and workers can't live on the current, current minimum wage. But raising the minimum wage is equivalent to communism, and communism has never worked. That argument is an example of which fallacy? Is it A, a straw man, B, an appeal to pity, or C, an ad hominem? Quiz question number two. Humans have eaten animals for thousands of years, so it is perfectly fine to continue eating them. That argument is an example of which fallacy? A, appeal to pity, B, appeal to tradition, or C, a red herring. All right, thanks for sticking through to the end of this. Hope you learned something about fallacies. We'll be back with more fallacies next time.